Craig currently serves as the president-elect of the Jones Graduate School Alumni Association and received his MBA from Rice here in 2008. And with Craig, we also have Bo. Bo is the co-founder of Brand Extract, um, which is uh, where he believes imagination and perseverance play an equal part in making believers. Um, perseverance um, is the grit required to share the vision and get others in the door. And with more than two decades as a veteran designer and entrepreneur, he works to channel his experience, including Brand Extract and his brand into helping other various clients identify transformation opportunities and when to seize them. Bo also earned his MBA from the Jones Graduate School of Business and he earned his in 2005. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Craig and Bo. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Well, that was uh, pretty flowery. Thank you. Uh, that'll be probably the nicest things you hear about our business today. So when, when the office asked me uh, to try to think of a session and put it together, um, Bo and I both do a lot of speaking about our entrepreneurship stories. And while we love to stand up here and stroke our egos and tell all the good things, I thought it would be a lot more entertaining um, that we actually dug into the trials and tribulations that you might not hear. So some things about the session we came up with was, um, first, hopefully this is a safe zone and we can be really vulnerable, a little extra vulnerable. So don't carry these stories out into the universe, uh, if you don't mind. Um, Bo and I have known each other for our six, almost seven years. So at Rice, there's a Rice Entrepreneurs Organization, and one of the things we have is a round table. We meet once a month for four and a half hours with six under other CEOs that are alumni, and we talk about business problems. And after a few years, you start talking about marriage, you start talking about a lot of things, and then it becomes a therapy group and kind of a, <laughs> a, a board of advisors. So we know each other very well. Um, and to keep myself honest, um, we have, uh, kind of made a friendly fire question drill here. So this session's really gonna be, I prepared some questions for Bo, because I know him very well, that you would not know to ask, and he's done the same. Um, we've made some basic ground rules of where we can't touch, uh, might be a little too personal. And I think it'll be a more real uh, discussion about entrepreneurship. The only thing I hope uh, is that as it gets a little dark, you know that there's a sunny flip side to it, because uh, <laughs> it can get really dark when you start talking about these trials and tribulations. So anybody thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, uh, don't be scared off by this. So we've already heard the, the, um, all the fun, successful things about our, our business. So if Bo, you'll just take five minutes and just tell us how you got started in it, maybe some of the real story that you don't tell the media, um, and kind of where you're at now, the size and shape of the organization. Sure. Uh so as I was preparing for this, Craig has no idea what I'm going to say right now, which is wonderful. Um, I am the product of an Italian and a German. And so you can imagine the conflict that goes on in my brain. Uh, my dad's a Marine. My mom is the most loving little tiny four foot ten Italian woman. Um, and that's what I grew up with. Uh, my grandfather was thrown off a bridge when she was 10. Um, and my father grew up without a dad. Um, and so you talked about not know those no things. idea. Um, and I was trying to think about how to start this, and I, I think that that's good context for why I am who I am. Um, I married a woman whose family was not wonderful to her. Um, and all of those people in my life have continually told me that I could do anything. Um, and that's why I started my own business. And my wife figured out at a certain point in time that I was absolutely miserable. Um, and she said, you need to quit. I've got two kids and a house payment and all kinds of hangups my own. I can't quit. But realistically, my parents and my wife and the people around me have been preparing me my entire life to run my own business, to lead people, um, to manage something. And so I'd love to tell you about Brand Extract and how we're wonderful at branding. And it's an absolutely horrible industry and business to be in right now. Um, but what I do every day is I give people an opportunity to live a great life. Um, that's what I chose and why I chose what I do. Uh, we are a branding firm. There are 32 of us. We're here. Um, we're here really for our own employees. We're not really here for our customers. Although I love my customers. I know that's going to sound really strange. I actually had to say that in a board meeting the other day to somebody. Um, I exist because they need our service. Uh, but my job is to make them great, and it's to make my people great. And so that's the way I look at our business. 
Um, that's the way I look at entrepreneurship. It's a little bit of a different slant to it. Uh, it's probably why I'm not driving a Maserati. <laughs> so, um, but you know, that's kind of a little bit. You know, our business has flourished, but it's been flat. Craig's going to ask some, probably some questions about that. Um, but that's all kind of part of the journey. So that's a little bit about me and kind of where I come from. Wouldn't you like to know what I'm going to ask you? Um, so uh, just to reflect here, I didn't know that about Bo, so I'm, I'm already learning something. This is like a therapy couch up here now. Um, Bo, I also half German and half Italian, as you know with my last name, Sicanti, but the other half is German, so I share some of, of that. Um, and I think my wife, come, as we've shared, my wife comes from some of that same background. Um, you know, my story getting into entrepreneurship, what I tell the media is that mom brought the family to a painting class, my brother and I brought beer there and got drunk. And this is how we came up with the idea to paint and sip, and this was a concept. Um, the media eats that up. What really happened there that night is I saw someone walk in and take cash from my father and leave while the artist stayed and taught the class. And I said, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I want to show up and, and take money. And later on, as the, as the idea progressed, um, I was single 28-year-old at the time, I realized it was a girls' night out type of business, and that was pretty attractive to me as well. Um, so those two drivers were the major drivers of starting the business. I don't share that uh, very often, but um, you know, these, these are the incentives uh, that we have. So the business has grown as Pinos Palette has, and we franchised the concept. Uh, and my passion has been in consulting um, and teaching and instructing. I instructed the Classcox School, just started a course in entrepreneurship, and that's where I'm passionate, and through franchising, it's really what you do. You teach new people to become entrepreneurs, and that's ultimately why we decided to do it. Um, we have 143 locations all over the U.S. right now. Uh, we open some, we close some, and everybody and their, their spouses and partners have uh, a lot of opinions on how we should run our business. Um, day in and day out. They're, they're not afraid to tell me about it uh, quite often. So, who wants to start? You or me? I'm going to start. Um, how does it feel when somebody closes one of their businesses? I didn't tell you I was going to ask that question. Don't tell me that. <laughs> how does it feel for me? So how does it feel for you? I'll, well, these, these are the hardest discussions because I think what I just said was that uh, I'm really passionate about helping people start and grow a business. And the, the antithesis of that is, is the death of the business. Um, and, and, the, and our franchisees, like any new business owner, they, they put their heart and soul into it. And many times they put their, their life savings into it. So it's, it's absolutely devastating to have a conversation um, with someone coming to you and asking, what can I do? I don't have any more money. I'm out. Uh, what options do I have? And there are no options other than to close the business. And it, it's really challenging and becomes a lot more of a um, emotional conversation than it is a practical business and coaching conversation. So the hardest part of the business by far for me, and it, it takes a big toll um, emotionally to, to close a business. And, and for the brand, it, it, it hurts the brand. It doesn't help the brand right. to, close, to close businesses either. Ouch. Sorry. All right. I'm out swinging. Now we're, now we're going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> he had no idea. Yeah, was I didn't. <laughs> All right. So I'll start with an easy one for you. Um, you know, Bo and I both uh, have a disease where we overcommit ourselves to volunteer organizations and boards and speaking engagements like this. Um, so why do you do it and how do you stop? <laughs> um, it's funny. I'm rolling off of Spring Valley City Council. Um, which I kind of question why I ever did that. Although we did build a new city hall, we did some really cool stuff. Um, but the front yard conversations with my neighbors um, were, were really interesting. When I'd be mowing the yard and they'd off, why don't we have speed bumps on the street? Or why are you tearing down trees? Or why are, you know, why are there loose dogs in the neighborhood? Um, but what I found in doing that, and I found in a lot of the social work that we do, uh, my business takes off a day, a quarter. We close the business and we all go do a service project. Um, they're just those things that I was able to engineer kind of in my business in my life. Uh, I, I think it's just because everybody I've been around, I was educated by the Jesuits. Um, I had parents that were always going to the church and doing different things. Uh, everybody I've been around my entire life has always kind of given back. And it's just a part of who I am. And it's a part of the business. 
Uh, there's a little bit of a marketing thing to it. You know, I mean, it's positive. The big people see it. They associate with our business someone that does good work and good works, uh, which I think is very valuable. Um, but I think that's kind of the way all this works. We all kind of work together. So that was a simple question. So follow up for you. This is yeah. where it gets tougher. How do you justify to your wife and your family that time <laughs> away? Because they, I'm surely they don't understand it's a business investment as much as you do. The, the funny thing is either my wife doesn't like me very much and hides it, um, <laughs> or my kids are tired of me talking to them and they want me out of the house. Um, but I still coach all the teams. I still really don't miss any events. Uh, you know, my dad was at everything I ever went to, so um, it somehow works. I mean, our lives are different. I, I think we, Craig and I were talking a little bit about kind of change in society. Um, I know you guys came to talk to two entrepreneurs, but this is kind of, I'm a branding person, so I see the way people behave all day long, the, why they buy stupid things that they shouldn't buy, why they overspend on products they shouldn't spend that much money on. Um, I, I think that there's this massive change in society where, you know, dinner was always at 6.30 in my house. Uh, life was, you know, mom cooked breakfast for me every morning. Um, you know, I'm the one that makes the breakfasts and the lunches every morning. My wife goes off to work and she teaches. She's a principal, or I'm principal. She's a, uh, I wish, a librarian. Actually, I don't wish she were principal. Um, you know, I get home, I go do my thing. I teach some class or, you know, go to council meeting. It, it all kinds of works and we spend time together. I think the one challenge to all this is we're hurried. I think my kids and my family feel like everything's cool, but I feel like we're rushed. I don't feel like I get enough time with them. So a little bit of why I'm backing down on a couple of things right now. I kind of have to reset every six years. I've kind of found that cycle. So does that answer that question? Yeah, good advice for me. Okay, yeah, he's younger than me. Um, what is it like to manage the expectations of hundreds of other entrepreneurs? Uh, I've, I've um, as I mentioned, it, I've, I find that a lot of times it's their partners and spouses that have a lot of opinions. Um, just as much as they do. So with every, every new owner, it's not like running a, a retail chain where they're all your employees and you can say, do this or I'll fire you or I'll find someone else to do the job. It uh, becomes a coaching, a constant coaching battle. And the need to explain the why, which I know your, your firm does quite, quite a lot, is, is way more important than the what. So telling them what they need to do is important, but you need, they need to believe in why you're asking them to do it or it won't get done at all. And this probably exists for a lot of large um, groups. And what we found lately is that, um, you know, at some point, there's good books like The Tipping Point where groups of people start to divide and have much different opinions and, and even collate into different organizations. So it becomes highly political. And I think it, uh, the more I, um, talk to other franchisors and CEOs of other, of other large franchisors, that gives me some, uh, some, some feeling that it's pretty normal for large groups to get political like that. Uh, I don't know if that happens in your organization with clients or whatever that is, but um, then you start just playing a political game and you have to find, I, uh, my biggest challenge right now is finding the balance of being hard, honest, and stern and transparent, but not so hard that it comes off aggressive and it alienates uh, too many people, and that's tricky to do. Really. And he and I manage artists, so I mean it's a different it's a different group of people, you know, when you're managing people that are either super sensitive um, or they want to make art. And so I, we, we're commercial arts. You combine this Italian and German, it's perfect. Uh, he's the same, right? He's managing people that want to have a painting business, um, and sometimes those people hire artists that they've got to manage. It's the most challenging group of people to manage, but also the most passionate group of people to manage. So balancing that's a challenge. You're up. Um, you know, I've, he I've heard you talk about sales goals for, I think, the last four years. It's been the same one every year. Is it four million or five million? Five million. Five million. You've been right at the cusp every year. It's going to be this year. It's going to be this year. It's going to be this year. This happened to us. That happened to us. One excuse after another. So. <laughs> I'd like you to explain to everybody why you haven't been able to break this $5 million barrier. And if you would just start each sentence with I, then that debt would, would make us work better, else. right? This is so hard for me because I'm like an Italian. I mean, I want to stand up and talk, so sitting here is awkward. Um, 
And I could punch him, too. I could, my arms are just taller. He's got the reach. <laughs> um, I haven't fired the people that I needed to fire. I haven't held myself as accountable as I should have held myself. I probably couldn't imagine the business as big as it should be. Um, again, growing up the way I grew up, my value was in doing things. You know, my, how hard I worked or the amount of hours that I put in was the value. I'm leading people now. It's not about the hours I put in, and it really technically is not really about the hours they put in anymore. These te this technology should make it so much faster and easier. Um, but my value came from, and I, we've talked a lot about this, uh, my value really came from the effort. And it, it's the outcome. You know, I'm, I'm almost 50. I've been doing this for 20, God, six years. More than that. Yeah, 26 years. Um, my ability to shift from doer to motivator uh, is a big deal. And so I have been leveling, kind of keeping our business level. Though we did hit our sales goal last year, we actually backed them down to hit off by smaller chunks. But the reason we're biting off smaller chunks is my partners and I um, can't see ourselves where we need to be. I, I think that's one of the biggest challenges. I've always been the guy that thought I was gonna play in the NFL or the guy that thought I was gonna you know, do this amazing thing. And I've always worked toward that. But the reality was I put the limit on myself. And now it's great because I've got kids. And these kids, I don't want them to put the same limits. I mean, I'm jumping off 25-foot cliffs into water, actually 52-foot cliffs into water. And I'm running marathons with my daughter, things that I would never have imagined doing. Um, and I think the reason my business is stuck where it is is I couldn't see it bigger than it was. And so that's a challenge. Now I've got, a, I've got four other partners. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm trying to now see that same thing that I'm seeing. And so I think that that's, I, I think we're all our own limiting factors. And some people that I'm amazed at, kind of that clicks for them at 12 years old, you know, a Steve Jobs kind of person. It's like, I'm gonna go start a business out of a garage. For me, it took me till I was about 36 to be able to see that. And it's taken me till I was 48 to finally embrace it. Um, so that's why we're stuck. Because I couldn't see what we could do. Excellent. I got a follow-up for you then. Because <laughs> um, I think this happens to a lot of, a, a lot of companies. You know, Bo's company is a, is a leading company both in, in Houston and Texas and, and all over on vision. And that's what right. you guys do. Right. You're, you're brand extract. We're going we're gonna to extract all the value and show you the vision of your brand. So why can't, I mean, the biggest reason I heard was that you can't vision it. What's stopping you guys from stepping out and brand extracting brand extract? <laughs> well, that's what we've done the last two years. Okay. Uh, and I think that that was, you know, it took a, a partner of mine. I'm, I'm not really a, I'm kind of a, a hug kind of guy. So it took one of my partners who's a little bit more of a jerk uh, to kind of slap us all and say, hey, look, this is where we're headed. Um, that's why you have partners, right? You have people, you put people around you. My wife's the same way. I, I mean, I dated all kinds of wonderful women that were so kind to me. And my daughter says my wife is my wife is a red hot. She is sweet, but man, once you bite into it, it kind of can burn sometimes. Um, it's just being recorded. Um, yeah. And I invited her Careful. here, but my son's got a he's coming back from a tree. Um, but quite honestly, that's what I need. You know, quite honestly, that's you surround yourself with people. I think that's the one thing in business is in life. You know, you surround yourself with people that you need. Um, not people that think like you. And, you know, my bride has been wonderful for that. We've been married 25 years, and I wouldn't be where I am without her. Uh, and so those things kind of, and she needs my kindness, so those, <laughs> those things balance each other out. Uh, they balance each other out over time, and I think that that's, that's how we've worked, or that's how I've worked to kind of overcome this. So hopefully next year, 5.2 million, I'll walk in here, I'll say, 5.2 million, I'll run out. Deal, I'll come with you. All right. So my turn. All right. Dude, I'm going to change, I'm going to completely change this question. So your beautiful little daughters have had all kinds of health issues. And your family is dealing with that. And Craig's young, right? I've got four kids. i got one in college. He's just starting his family. What's your biggest fear about both business 
and managing your family with all the craziness that's happened over the last couple of years? Yeah, so the, um, this is this is tough for any. I think any entrepreneur. I mean, you 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 become the brand. Uh, you really do. And uh, we've had we've had a lot of challenges, but people, you know, there's plenty of people that have way more than us, and we have a lot of allergies. I think they're up to six or seven foods that they can eat at two and a half. I mean, just terrible allergies. But um, people have worse, and you know, I have a wife that is incredible at what she does uh, to take care of them. I think my my fears are just just like a lot of people is, is failure, right? You know, Pinot's palate fails. It, I mean, I come to the university and talk about Pinot's Palette all the time as a success story, and in 10 years, we're like, oh, that Pinot's Palette guy, Pinot's Palette failed. It went belly up. It's all gone. Where is, where is he now? Right. And, and obviously, my, my kids growing up, seeing it and hearing what I do, um, uh, that, I think that's hard, because those are, those are people you don't want to let down. You want to be uh, a role model uh, for them, and a lot of other people. So, right. failure, uh, business failure, when you're you're so tied to it. I think it's 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 like getting fired or laid off from a job times ten because you are you are it. Uh, so that, I think that's that's my biggest fear. Okay. Good. I'm afraid too. <laughs> that that was one of my biggest challenges was the this. You know, I've, I've been building this business for 15 years. You know, and I do. I sit down and think sometimes. Well, man, if I lost my dad lost his business uh, when I was in college, so I had to. Kind of, I had to pay for my last two and a half years, um, and I just kind of had to figure it out. Um, and he's since recreated himself and reconnected. Now he's a Tesla. It's heart disease. He plugs into the wall every night. Um, it's pretty amazing, the technology and the way he does stuff. That's what he calls himself. I've been really pretty loose about my family here, so if they see this, we'll see what happens at Christmas. But. Um, <laughs> So when, 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 as kids, let me ask you, so as kids get older, do you, do you worry about that less or more, the, the dad is a successful entrepreneur, uh, will they, do you worry about it less or more? You know, coming back, I, I, this is going to be sound kind of, I'm, this is not like a loaded thing here. Um, coming back to Rice, I mean, I'm a knucklehead. I mean, I played football and basketball and baseball. I thought, I really did think I was going to play football and do whatever. I thought it was too small, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, that didn't work out. I switched to basketball, and that didn't work out. So I got a fine arts degree. Um, it's worked out, but it took a little while to get started. Um, I've had tons of failure, like, and I've always set myself up for ridiculous goals. And so my kids, they're going to love me no matter what. And I know that that's the thing. My parents are going to love me no matter what. And my wife is going to love me no matter what. Um, and so I don't really worry about that piece. But there is this part of me as I get older, as my life gets more and more into this business and the ethos that I've built around me, man, you know, but my dad lost a business. And so I get to talk to him about that all the time. And he shares his feelings and emotions and thoughts, which is really weird. It's the old giant Marine Corps guy. Um, but it's, you know, that helps me. That has helped me. Um, so I don't really have a fear about that. And I don't really have a fear about what's next, uh, which is cool. Let's talk about that. Here's your next question. Hey, wait a second. You're asking all these questions. All right. It's my turn or your turn? Go ahead. It's my turn. You asked the last Let one. You asked about my kids. All right. Um, so I think, here's my question. I know there's a moment that passes for entrepreneurs where there's just no turning back. You, you, you've done it long enough that you cannot envision life again. Any entrepreneurs here? Anybody own a business? Okay. So maybe they'll, they'll relate. Uh, there's just no turning back. Going back to, to having a job and, and, and doing that grind is, and you know, the, the direct deposit fare is nice, but um, it's, it's tough. And you've had some kind of entrepreneurship midlife crises, like wanting to, you talked about wanting to buy a Shakey's pizza at one point. Um, so what would you do if, if brand extract went away? It's just poof gone. You sold it or, or it closed. What's, what would you do next? I think... Um and I'll preface this. So my wife always walks and she'll say, let's move the furniture. And my initial answer is always no. I mean, and my daughter just changed majors for the second time. Um, and so we've had these wonderful conversations over the last five days uh, about changing majors. And um, <laughs> unreal. A and um, I'm always thinking kind of five steps ahead. And it's not, it doesn't stop. I'm in the here and now. I'm getting things done. I'm not changing. 
Um, I teach and coach. The, the problem is I'm in a lifestyle that's different than what a teacher and a coacher, coacher, a coach would be. And so reconciling that right now at this point in my life, the change probably wouldn't be a problem because my wife rips me into different things all the time. Um, so I'm getting over that piece. But the, 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 again, the ethos, right? I mean, when Rice calls me to ask for money, <laughs> I'm a coach. <laughs> I can't give you money. What are you talking about? You know, or Jesuit calls me and wants something, you know, sorry, I'm a teacher. I can't do that right now. Um, those are the things that I think about, like crazy little things you think about when you think about that massive shift in a you know, change in your life. And so that's something that as a business owner, I do think about. You do you downsize your life? Would you have to? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to fit, to do it right and probably have to. You wouldn't go start a new business. Just quit entrepreneurship. You're just a coach. You're a coach. Yeah, I'd probably last. No, about noble four, profession. But I'd last four or five years. I'd do something. I'd figure something out. But I'm not a serial entrepreneur. I mean, there are different types of entrepreneurs, right? I mean, I like managing and running a business. I don't have this giant desire to take that investment, and turn into another investment, turn into another investment. While that would be wonderful, um, that's not my thing. We've got a guy in our group that has turned up four businesses over the last, and now he's like in four other ones. And I just. I couldn't imagine being Jeff. Yeah. It's just not my Why? shtick. Um, I, I like things simpler, yeah. I guess. I don't know. Maybe the German in me is like, no, this is the one way to go. But, yeah. Yeah, Biggest surprise in starting a business. I mean, what's the, like, all the things you thought were going to happen that didn't, but what was the biggest surprise of all? Biggest surprise. I have to rack my brain for that one. Um, I think, honestly, was some of the one of the biggest surprises that I had as, as far as starting a franchise system and and these very eager entrepreneurs, it, it blows me away sometimes that the blocking and tackling is so difficult, and that that is such a surprise to me. I, I mean, I expected the people problems and the employee up and down, and I expected the financial times and all the things that came with owning and operating a business. It was that. People that would could possibly buy a business and invest a lot of money, and then not find the time to answer their customers' phone calls. Right. So that was the biggest surprise for me. That just stung. I mean, year over year, even after showing all this data, hey, look, we're not answering our phone 30% of the time. These are paid customers calling us, and of course, I go talk to my other franchisor CEOs, Menchies. Uh, they're like, that is not. That is a very typical problem for business owners. They're just not, you know, 30% of them are just not cut out to work hard and commit to that thing. And I think it's, it's what I see in my class too and what we spend a lot of extra time on is making sure that the, the business, the new entrepreneurs looking at starting is a good fit for them. Because it doesn't mean they're bad entrepreneurs, it's just this business is not the right business for them. And there could be another business that is an excellent fit where it doesn't call talking to, maybe they don't like to talk to customers. Maybe they don't like to get paid. I don't know. They need a, they need a nonprofit business, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is. I mean, nonprofits definitely need to, they call their customers probably twice uh, as hard as our business does, but because they have to. Um, so that, that was a big surprise. I thought we would be working on these complex marketing strategy, operational plans, and here we are just trying to get blocking and tackling. Just call people back. Just, just when people have money and they call you, answer the phone and ask for their credit card. Really novel. That's my biggest surprise. I'm surprised. All right, sir. Let's see how we're doing on time. All right. We'll do one, one more piece, and then we'll uh, open up to questions. You guys have any questions? All right. Maybe. Okay. Uh, oil and gas. This is a big question, and, and it, it comes up at the Jones School all the time about Houston, and I know a lot of your clients are in Houston. Um, oil and gas, we had a downturn. What are you calling it? Downturn? Flattened out area? Change in the industry. Change in the industry. So, <laughs> so I, know, I know you haven't been unaffected like many other businesses in Houston. I mean, our stores were affected. How have you, what did you do pre that event, and what have you done since to kind of diversify uh, to, to make up for that business? Uh, there's a difference between profit and revenue. 
Um, well, we bought a business. We spent a lot of money. And we went into debt right before all that happened. It was wonderful. It's a great idea. Brilliant. Uh, we saw it happening. We knew, I mean, you can see the train wreck. It happened, it's happened to us three times in the life cycle of our business. Um, and I didn't put the brakes on quick enough. Uh, that said, I managed my people through pay cuts, uh, managed them through all that kind of stuff, and we kept our team moving. And so when things have clicked again, you know, we're all there, uh, which has been wonderful, uh, which has worked out really well. So I don't think we screwed it up completely. Um, Being, being in a city like Houston has been really interesting. Um, the, the energy industry hits all of us so interestingly. Uh, and the one thing that I've always kind of prided myself on and I kind of pride our business on is, well, you know, okay, now what do we do next? You know, I can't control that, what can I control? And I think we worked really hard to control our staff, to control the culture, um, to make sure that we were financially sound, had the right partnerships in place, um, which has then turned into us learning a ton. You know, Houston will never be the same. You know, I think actually this energy change, this downturn, I don't want to call it downturn, this shift in the way these businesses have commoditized and changed, um, they'll never be the same. There was a little bit of a period where in the 80s, I mean, I remember this, right? I was in my dad's boardroom when Houston was going and he had five carpet stores all over the all over the city, and then all of a sudden, Houston stopped growing. It just stopped. And he's got stores and carpet, and you can imagine the carpet business. I mean, it's predicated on growth. They buy once every 10 years, Dad. You know, and he was trying to change the business, and he couldn't do it really fast, quickly. And, and the amazing thing about this change, um, I think for us too, is that everything's commoditized. Everything's a commodity today. I'm not special. He's not special. And what I mean by that is, technology has made things so quickly. It's an economics piece. That $5 billion rig that's drilling way deep, deep, deep water offshore, is this, is, there's another person out there that can do it just as well. Just as well. So the technology doesn't matter as much. And so how do you differentiate? How do you change? How do you move forward? How do these technologies change the way we think about our businesses? Um, how do my guys think about how they can do things more efficiently rather than doing? And so we're, we're adapting to that. And I think everybody is. The businesses we're working with, Oceaneering, Transocean, all of them, I mean, they're on it. Their leadership is really thinking about what's next. Well, we, can do, we can do more with less people, where the technology allows us to do more, um, but there are only going to be there only be fewer of us because we can do, we can drill deeper, we can get more energy out of the ground, we can do those things. How do we make that work? And so, I don't know, it's a kind of a roundabout weird way of looking at this. We got a lot of insights about these companies and how they were going to change for the future out of the downturn, um, which has been really interesting. And I think it's also affecting all of us psychologically, um, where we head, how we handle our business, how we manage this going forward. So, I don't know, it's not a knock, it's an interesting time that we live in, um, it's just kind of had a big impact on our It's not any one specific industry you're targeting, just an overall adaptation to everything. Right. I mean, we are we are very centric to energy here, um, and we're not diverse, trying to diversify for diversity's sake. It's just everything's becoming so entwined. It's kind of interesting. Next steps for Phoenix Power. Next steps. Um, I think, uh, you know, our, our plan is to continue growth in the U.S. And we, we hope we can do that. Uh, like Bo mentioned, paint and sip was a very new industry in 2009 when we started it. And now it's become everybody under the sun. I mean, I knew it was a commodity the, the day I saw a website up that was paintuntilyoufaint.com. And I'm like, this has got to be a joke. No, that's a real establishment. Um, and there's thousands, there's thousands of them in all kinds of varieties now. And, and paint on brushes, paint on this. There's a DJ rave session with painting. It's like a <laughs> rock concert with painting in it. They're doing it on the cruise line. So it's everywhere. We, I mean, we have to kind of fight towards uh, innovation as, as fast as humanly possible. And, and just remember that we are not a painting company and we're, we're here for entertainment. Just do it better than everybody else. Um, I think my hope is at least 
like many growing industries, is everybody sees it, everybody sees the financial opportunity, companies rush in, and eventually those margins tighten, and that we have a stronger, smarter team that with, can withstand some of that time, and then people will you know, exit, and there'll be market opportunities to fill those gaps and, and come on strong. So that's my current strategy. <laughs> um, but you know, we'll have to adapt like everybody else. I mean, I don't think that's unusual to business. It's just our first major big blow of, you know, as you know, I came into Riceo like every month for four years. Numbers are up, double digit sales growth. We just sold 59 new locations this year. And that, that has um, all but just about frozen. And uh, we'll, we'll, we got some fight ahead of us. And, and hopefully all the, the political stuff I talked about before, we can lead through that. I feel the weight of that on my shoulders. Uh, into innovation and whatever our, our new kind of hedgehog concept is. Uh, I don't think we've found it yet, but we'll get there. All right. I think that was the end of our one-on-one -on -one torture. <laughs> love, love to open up to, to questions from any of you. Yeah, right here. Yeah, this, this has changed for us. Um, we, we've always been very honest, uh, and that does not always happen in the franchise space, honestly. Um, we've always been very honest on the commitment of time and money, and you know, we try to, depending on the person, uh, say, hey, are you ready to have another child? This is, and, and a kid doesn't come out and just walk and wipe its own butt, and you know, just like a business doesn't, especially our business, our size. So we're very honest, and now, even further because it's so critical, we have so much competition that that owner is fully focused on it. We do not allow absentee owners in. They have to basically sign that they're committing to an operation plan that they're going to be working you know, 40, 50 hour weeks and smart, um, not just the hours that they're, that they're selling in town and they're not just going to try to you know, manage a video game. Um, and that's, that's something that's changed in our business and we have to be really honest. And those that have come in with the you know, improper expectations, we either have to change them or try to uh, convince them to graduate as, into a customer um, and bring a, bring a new owner into the, into the mix. Good, good question. There was another one, I think, towards the back. Or, Yeah, so we, this is uh, continued to increase m largely because we learn more about what's successful. You know, when we're early, we're kind of just trying to find people like us a little bit as far as work ethic and skill set. Um, over time, it's become highly scientific. So we have personality tests, we do interviews, we have, uh, you know, committees that kind of rank and score people across different things. Um, and we have financial qualifiers, we do background checks. So there's a lot involved to get into our brand. but um, there can never be enough, and you're gonna miss, uh, and that 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 has happened um, quite a bit uh, to us. So we just continue to try to evolve that cycle. Uh, I mean, some places, some brands like Chick Fil A, I mean, they're so strict. I mean, it's like you need to work in the place for a year or two. People are shaking, shaking their heads before you even get a chance to possibly own it. So they that's like uber strict. Um, so we you know we try to do the best job we can, and then just coach, coach, coach. To get them to where we need to get them. So we had a session earlier saying about the honor system. And it's, it's kind of ingrained in our culture, at least in the South, that honor is the big you know, virtue to have. Uh, Y'all kind of implied something that I, I just want to wonder if you have a feeling about, and that's growth. I know when I own my business, it was always, you know, you grow or you die. But not necessarily true. I mean, you know, well, you can have a great business that doesn't grow. Right. So Growth, yeah. But y'all have any feelings on that at this point in time? Absolutely. Um, so, again, I've got so many little sayings my dad gave me growing up. Um, one was, if you're not growing, you're going. I mean, he would always say that to me. And, and there is a point where, as an entrepreneur or a business owner, you kind of have to do a check. I mean, do you guys remember Bill Fitch, the basketball coach? Okay, so Bill Fitch had Akeem Olajuwon and Ralph Sampson. And in 1986, he went to the, he went to the playoffs. Uh, 
and they could never win. Right? And Bill Fitch got fired. And I was, as a kid, I thought, man, why in the world is Bill Fitch getting fired? He just went to the playoffs a couple years ago. Um, Bill Fitch was a great builder. He could build a team. He could never, he did the same thing with the Celtics. He could never get them to really go. And I've had to check myself a little bit about that. You know, am I the guy? Growing for me may not be financial growth. And we're a business and I've got partners. And so growth has now become more introspective. I talk to my clients about this all the time too. They may not be able to grow their business, but they still need what we do because they need to grow you know, product value or they may need to grow their people. Um, and so that's how I've kind of shifted that growth desire is a little bit about, you know, how do we grow to be a better company? And if that happens to be more money over time, or it happens to be some crazy growth goal that I put on our business, I probably shouldn't. Um, you know, I'm still growing. We're still moving forward and the people there are still growing. And I think that that's, that's the way I've attacked that. I mean, our mission is to inspire people to create, transform and grow. So, I mean, you captured it perfectly. I, we just need to get better. I think is kind of where I'm at. I think I think sometimes what happens when authors they they try to make a statement by oversimplifying things, and you get a lot of models that way that uh, are good for statements. And I think that one came from there are a lot of businesses that stagnate and stay there and get in a lot of trouble. You know, I, I have a friend who has a business that ran it for way too long. It should not have gone on that long, and they lost a lot of money. And they should, you know. That, that saying, I think, was put in place for these people to be like, well, you're growing your time. One is time. for revenue, the other one is how to vote that. It would be all things. I mean, I know a couple of your competitors, they're totally transforming their business right now. Right. I mean, they're not particularly looking for monetary growth. They're, they're changing, changing their business. And that change drives them. It sustains them. And that, you know, that, and that works. And that's hard, too. Like, when you go to business school, there's a little bit of a different you know, shareholder value kind of message to you. There's a point where you have to go, hey, look, we're good. We're $5 million. We're making a profit. It's a good business. I enjoy doing it. Let's just go. It's all right. If we happen to hit a flywheel or something happens, great. Um, but constantly remaking yourself is a part of that. And I think that that's got to be a component. But, you know, nothing wrong with having a service company that does four million dollars in revenue and a million dollar in profit and it's the same every year. I'll do that. <laughs> I'll do that forever. We'll do Growing, that too. It's not going, right? That's yeah. that's money in the bank. So I, I think you're right by saying, you know, these simplified statements are are sometimes not thoughtful. Yeah, that's a good question. No, it's a great question. Do you want to jump first? Yeah, I'll go. I'll go first. So, um, some some background on this. Um, uh, you know, Hu Station Houston is is down there now, and they're pretty involved. Uh, obviously, so happy to see Rice involved and kind of in a lead role from a school perspective um, to be involved in this. Because the challenge right now is in Houston, we lack in some of the tech and tech investment money uh, that that the West Coast has. So you have a high tech idea. Uh, it's great to have venture capitalists with a bunch of money to, to put on it. You, you just you, It's hard to get a Google type of company that come out of Houston without that kind of innovation center. So I think that's where they're starting. The incubators, for me, there's a lot of different models for incubators, but incubators like Station Houston, the premise is it's a rental space. You come in and rent space. They have mentor programs. They, you know, people help each other that are there working on ideas company, large oil and gas companies, go there and actually say, if one of you could solve this, we have this whole market. So it's this fertile ground, um, and even venture capitalists will office out of there. I've so, heard that before. You know, they can walk right upstairs and have uh, quick discussions. So I, I think any time you get entrepreneurs in a room together with business problems and potentially money, it's, it can become lightning in a bottle. And I think that's the, the hope that is what happens down there. I, I, don't, I don't see it as a... Everybody's going to follow through the same, same process um, type of thing. It's just 
making this fertile, extra fertile ground. That's my read on it. I'm trying to break out in my head whether this is a, hey, we should move the couch kind of thing, where I initially respond, no. <laughs> um, so HTC just closed, Houston Technology Center. And, and you can have a conversation about why that happened. Um, we did the branding for it, we rebrand for it about 10 years ago. Uh, whether it was a leadership issue, whether its business model didn't keep up with the times, you know, everything's real nimble now and big open spaces and all that. Um, and I'm trying to kind of guard myself from being the kind of old guy going, oh, that's crazy, why would that work? Um, I think there's something to just starting, to just having an idea and putting the people you know together and starting. And I think incubators and those kind of things, they can help. But the, I think it might be too much support for someone coming up with an idea. Um, and so I don't know, I haven't read enough about exactly how they're gonna do it different than the other 52 incubators in Houston. Um, but I don't see over the last 10 or 15 years of these, these companies that are just flying out of there. Um, and you would think that over time that would happen. And I'm not saying it doesn't happen, and I'm not saying it can't, uh, but I think there is something to having the right people around each other. Um, and what I've noticed with a lot of these, these kind of incubators and groups is it's just kind of catch all. You know, they get people in and they do stuff and, it, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, a jury will be out, right? I mean, at least we're trying something. Um, but the, and I think Rice's brand is trying to present itself around, position itself around entrepreneurship. Um, the Jones School, you know, 10 of my 90 classmates all started businesses right out of school. Um, the other, uh, 10, 10, 10 or 15 more are CEOs of large companies, so there's a leadership bent to it. Um, but I don't know, there's something about finding some crazy technology and having it hit that I don't know that you can get it out of a, a structured kind of environment. But I don't know, we'll see. It's a good question. <coughs> Any other questions? Right. Yeah, I'd love to hear your uh, part to this too. Uh, the class starts October second. Uh, you're welcome. To <laughs> no, um, you've been there. So I think what we, we really we look at and talk about is you know part of it is just where are you at in life, and if you if you're in a stage where you don't have a lot of time, or also your experience um, experience plays a big part and role in it. We look at a lot of Harvard Business Review cases where the people didn't have the experience. We look at success stories where they did. Um, so do you have the experience to effectively compete in that market? I think that's something that entrepreneurs sometimes miss. Uh, I see it a lot. I mean, how many times has someone said, I'm, I'm gonna, I, got an, I got a great idea, Bo. Uh, I'm gonna start a brewery. <laughs> have, you, have you worked in a bar? No? I just did a home brew kit and it's really good. Uh, <laughs> Have you, didn't done, have you been in distribution? Have you worked for Anheuser? Nope, haven't done that yet. Uh, do you want to meet Friday afternoon? No, I have my kids' baseball game. Do you know you're gonna be, be in bars every day? So that's an example of like, are you sure your lifestyle is right for that? Do you have the experience? Because the people doing this, like Buffalo Bayou, Rasul, Rasul, do you guys know Rasul? Rice undergrad, he did uh, poetry in English or something. Then he did Harvard Business uh, MBA. He worked for Anheuser for three years as a distributor, two years in a, as an analyst, came back to Houston and started a brewery, which has been successful. So that's who you're competing against. So I, I think a lot of it is just being real honest with yourself about uh, that kind of experience. We have some ranking systems, like a best model, but a lot of it's just, do you have what it takes? Do you have the experience? Do you have the money? Do you have the time to really do that model that you're after? What do you think? Yeah, I think finding, that, finding that component is massive because we always have companies that come. We don't it, startups are not our thing. So we just we have there's got to be more of a company for us to do a brand on it than just from something from scratch. It's just our process, um, and, and we find that right. We're, I'm going to start a real estate company. Well, have you ever done anything in real estate? No. 
I mean, I bought a house, but that's not going to, you know, <laughs> contracts, you know, uh, demographics, I mean, all that kind of stuff. I, I think that's a huge part of it. I, the Italian part of me, right, on the emotional side, um, I, I don't want to sound trite. Fearlessness is kind of a big thing, and I don't mean that from a reckless like reckless abandon, I'm gonna put a helmet on and go through a wall kind of fearlessness. But just the idea, maybe it's just optimism. You know, they have to have a little bit of, nothing's gonna stop me. I can do this. I mean, I, this is pretty easy. I can put this stuff together. There's just something about that simplicity of mind that I think really helps someone that's gonna, that wants to have run a business. I mean, those of you that have run a business or been around people that have run a business, there's just that, that clarity of what the story is, why I'm doing it, why I'm going to be good at it, and, and I can do this. There's that piece to it. When I've got two friends right now that are trying to start a business, they have beautiful business plans, they've been in the business a long time, and oh my God, they're, they put so many hurdles in their way. If I don't have the website, and I have the logo, and I have the this, and I have the that, and I'm like, you're never going to do this. I mean, you're never going to get an investor because it's too confusing. You're never going to figure out a way to make it work if you don't just drop anchor and go. Um, and there's a, well, you can't drop anchor and go. So pull anchor and go. I know. Well, that's kind of the way I do it, but um, I always want to pull an anchor behind that's me. That's why he's not past five million. Yeah, he's got his right. anchor down. Slowly, slowly. Pull it up. Um, but there, there's something to just being able to just, I'm going to go do this. And I, I see That's that true. in a lot of the, like the kids I coach. I coach a bunch of basketball teams and all that kind of stuff. They always put these barriers up in front of them that aren't really there. And what I find is most entrepreneurs have either fought through that or have figured it out. And that makes it roll. So I think on top of the technical skill and context, you know, is that, oh, yeah, I can do this. Um, which we don't see a lot, a lot of people. One of the analogies I like to give is, has anybody seen the movie The Martian with Matt Damon? It's a good movie, good right? Analogy. That That is a good analogy to entrepreneurship. He's kind of stuck there and he just looks at one problem at a time. He needs confidence that he'll solve that problem. He doesn't know how he's going to get off the planet yet, but he just works the problem and works the next problem and the next problem. And eventually he gets there, but it's, you know, there, and there's ups and downs and he has some good days and bad days. Um, but that's kind of what it's like. And, and some people like our friend Jeff, they're really comfortable in that zone of I don't know the end, but I, I'll work this problem and I'm confident that I'll solve it and the next one and the next one. Right. And then he's out in outer space hugging that other person. Right. <laughs> one, I think we've got time for one more question. Especially in my business, I mean, because it. What, what energy or time do you put into looking around the corner, to see kind of what's going to disrupt your business, right? So, you know, if I had a phone booth company, I'd be kind of dead now, you know. But people that saw telecom or then they saw something else and transformed their businesses. That's a great question. That's a great question for you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I'll answer it really, really quickly and then let him go. Uh, my business, I'm constantly looking at that. In, in my business 20 years ago, there were typesetters and there were stat people and people that used film and, and photographers and retouchers. There was a woman in town, Raphael, who built an entire business and made millions of dollars and it's all in one button on Photoshop. One button. This is the commodity thing that's happening, right? It's happening so fast that we don't know which, oh, we could be a social media company. Oh, we should be this. Oh, we should be that. Wait a minute. Facebook's going to go away because the whatever, and this is good. They're not going to let you share any more information. So what happens that? It's happening so fast. And so, yes, I'm constantly looking and going, what kind of firm are we? Are we a consulting firm? Are we, I mean, I'm a graphic designer. That profession is going to be dead in five or six years. I mean, people that logotournament.com, him, this guy right here is going to put me out of business. 
Because he goes and gets a logo off Logo Tournament, and then as a designer, try to change it and make it better. And he has gone with design firms and agencies, and he hasn't. And it works. That's the frightening thing for me, like looking around that, you know, is that, wait a minute, part of my business could be gone. So is it technology? So yes, I'm always on it. I have no idea what's next. That's the frightening part about this, is it's happening so fast. You know, that typographic company that went away, it took it about, it was good for 40 years and it took it about 15. Businesses are closing like that. There's a technology, somebody builds an algorithm that buys media for you. You know, well what happens to the ad agency that's, their whole, all their revenue is based on how much media they buy. Um, and so we look at that. The thinking part of what we do, though there aren't many other people that can do it like we can do it. So how do I shift? And so that's kind of where my head is, but yes, that is my job as CEO of this business at 48 that still has two kids, three kids to go through college, <laughs> you know, it, unless I decide to get pull, you know, go become a coach and a teacher, you know, I've got to see what's next. So yeah, my majority of my day is th thinking about those things while I'm doing everything else. I think there's, there's two methodologies that we've put in place that have helped us with that, that question. Um, one was EOS, uh, which is kind of a business management framework, because I have a partner, I have a co-founder, and we kind of double dipped in this visionary who should be looking around the corner role and sometimes there's a period of times where none of us were doing it and sometimes we're both doing it and that that EOS has given us a model where I'm the appointed visionary it's my job to do that and his job is to keep the change trains running on time the other methodology um, just having the time to do that is clear that that's my role has been good the other uh, methodology is what we teach in class a lot more in entrepreneurship than the traditional business planning, which is the lean startup. So everything should be very rapid fire testing. So it's not as much of what corner am I looking at and a lot of research. It's stick your hand out there and see if it gets shot. That's okay. We can lose <laughs> a finger. No big deal. Um, and, we're, and it's just constant testing, testing, testing of small chunks, what we'll call, we call it MVP, the minimal viable product, get it out in the market quick, test it, um, and then try to move forward. And this very iterative kind of testing approach to entrepreneurship is, um, I think, how a lot of people kind of pave that way and find the way without doing you know, six to nine months of research to try to, to guess, and then you have all these hypotheses that, that fail, because they're built off of like 10, 15, 20 assumptions uh, that, that are wrong somewhere. So just rapid fire, constant testing in different markets. That's, I think that's what's worked the best. All right, I think that's our session. Guys, thank you so much for the therapy. Thank you, Bo.